All right. Well, why don't we begin? Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, your organizer, and your chief cat herder for the hour. I'm very glad to see you all here today. We have a terrific topic with a great, great expert, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now I want to introduce this week's guest. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Doug Shapiro. He is the executive research director for one of the most important research outfits in the world focusing on higher education. It's the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. And what Doug does is he looks carefully at data in order to understand who our students are today. Um, let me just welcome you. Doug, greetings. Hi, Brian. How are you? Great. Good to see you and good to hear from you. How are you doing today? I'm doing much better now that you can hear me <laughs> and I can hear you. <laughs> That's the idea of video conferencing. <laughs> so, so glad to see you. So glad to see you. And where are you today? I'm very glad to be here. I'm really excited. Great. Great. Where have we found you? Are you in Virginia right now? Yes, I'm in Herndon, Virginia. Oh, excellent. Just outside excellent. of D.C. This Great. is the Clearinghouse's main office. Well, in, in order to give people a sense of your work and uh, to give people a sense of the Clearinghouse, let me just ask, looking ahead to the next uh, academic year, 2019, 2020, what are the big issues and the big projects that are looming ahead for you in the Clearinghouse? Well, we are, uh, one of our biggest projects that we're really excited about is a new report that we're gonna be releasing um, at the end of this month, actually, that's oh. looking at the uh, 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 an unusual topic for us. This is the second time we've done it. The first was uh, uh, five years ago when we, uh, we, we plunged the depths of our enrollment database and degree databases and found all the students who had some enrolled in college at some point in the last 25 years and had Ooh. never finished a degree. So we're calling that our uh, some college no degree report. Uh -huh. Some college no degree. That's ah, very, very important. Those are some of the, in some ways, that's the kind of the worst way to experience college. Well, absolutely. I think it's one of the greatest fears nowadays when you talk to students and parents about uh, the idea of going to college, which today uh, increasingly means taking on significant amounts of student loans and right. debt. And the worst thing you can possibly do in that situation is end up with uh, that student debt and no credential, no degree or certificate or anything to help you uh, earn a, a, a better income that can help you pay off that debt. I mean, that's really become the promise of higher education today. Um, it's no, it, you know, for many students, I think it's not so much about what they learn, it's about what they're going to earn. And uh, that experience of having uh, debt and classes, but no sheepskin, it's going to imp not going to help them on either front. Um, Absolutely. Well, um, that's a, I'm really looking forward to that report, and uh, maybe maybe in the next few minutes I can ask you for a few teasers from the report, if possible. Um, but friends, before I proceed, let me just say, if you're new to the forum or if you haven't been here for a while, know that I have a lot of questions for our, our poor guest. I'm going to just interrogate the forum. <laughs> the important thing here is for you to ask questions. So think about, for example, what Doug can tell us about students today, uh, what, what pointers to the future, what trend lines is he observing, and how do those connect with your own institution, be it a library, a museum, a college, or a university? Um, please, uh, he's very, very friendly, and I'll be very nice to help out. So think of the questions that you'd like him to ask. Um, and as I say that, um, we, um, um, I want to actually begin with one particular question to start off with, which is thinking about your student database, what proportion of students now are traditional age and what proportion are adult? Well, most students today are still traditional age, um, but, but what we see in our database is we've seen some pretty wide swings, uh, particularly uh, over the past nine years since the, uh, um, uh, you know, enrollments 
we had one of the things that we've been tracking pretty closely is that um, uh, ever since the Great Recession, uh, enrollments in higher education, as you know, just mushroomed for a few years. And most of those gr that growth in uh, enrollment was among older students. Makes perfect sense to any economist. Unemployment goes up. You've got a lot of adults leaving the workforce, either right. voluntarily or involuntarily. They flow into college to try and increase their uh, um, their skills and and um, qualifications, so that when the economy improves, they're ready for a better job. And ever since then, that that trend peaked in about 2011. Uh -huh. and, and since since 2011, college enrollments have been steadily declining about one and a half percent a year. We've lost over 2 million students as of last fall, and we expect this to continue this fall, uh, since the fall of really? 2011 in the US. And most of that, about three quarters of that decline was students over the age of 24. And what's really interesting is that in that same time period, the demographics of traditional students, traditional age students, have been changing as well. And this has to do with birth trends 18 to 20 years ago and uh, uh, changing uh, kind of changes in um, family income and uh, um, the ability to pay for college, increases in the uh, cost of college. And what we're starting to see in just the last year or two is that traditional age students are starting to decline in numbers at an even faster pace than that long running decline in older students. Wow. So in the last year, uh, first time traditional age students declined by over four percentage points from fall of 2017. Oh. And that was compared to only about a 2% uh, decline in older students. So we're still seeing a slow decline trickling out of adult students, but suddenly the de demographics of traditional age students are, t are starting to uh, take over and we're seeing a decline in, tr in, in younger students as well. This is enormously, enormously important for, I would say, the supermajority of colleges and universities, the ones that are dependent on enrollment for tuition. Um, much less for the very foundational purpose of teaching and learning. Um, how far down are we from 2011? About 8%? Uh, it's about 10%, actually. 10%. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. we had a long boom starting in the early 80s that just kept truckling, truckling along, and then around 2008 we had a little spike, and now yeah. we're, we're just nosing down. Yeah. Yeah, and a big part of that increase going back to the 80s was actually increasing uh, college progression rates or enrollment rates. So right. if you think of the share, the percent of high school graduates who actually went to college, that had been steadily increasing uh, for for a generation. And that, that trend has, in my view, pretty much maxed out. Um, um, there may be slight increases, but it, I think we're more likely to see start seeing slight declines in the percentage of high school students uh, going to college. But what's more important is that there are simply fewer high school students graduating today. Right. Yeah. And, and that's uneven across the United States, but... Um, Absolutely. So some regions of the country are still seeing growth, particularly in the South and West. But if you look across some of the traditional... Uh, um, kind of historical strong areas of higher education institutions in the Northeast and the Midwest, uh, that's where we're seeing the biggest declines simply in demographics of traditional age students. We have a, a quick question. Um, let me just flash this on the screen uh, from uh, Jen Obando. Uh, that's a clarification about that. And Jen wants to know, is there a significant difference between the decline in undergrad versus grad school? Yeah, very good. In, uh, in, New, in New Jersey, the Stevens Institute. Good yeah, you, Jen. that's an excellent question, Jen. And, you're, and uh, uh, the answer is there's a, there's a big difference. What we're seeing is uh, actual increases in the numbers of graduate students across all um, different types of institutions, public and private, uh, that is partially offsetting the declines today in undergraduate students. So almost all the declines are in undergraduate students. So we have um, uh, 
a kind of maybe think of this as a shift in enrollment where the amount, the proportion of students who are undergrad is being to decline, the proportion of our grad is being to increase. Right. So the, for those institutions that offer graduate programs, that is helping to uh, uh, to to mitigate the effects of the enrollment declines. But of course, for community colleges and two year institutions, uh, that's where you see the biggest overall declines because they don't have the ability to attract those graduate students. And and I think it's interesting that the the um, what that says about the value of college today. A lot of people look at these overall declines in college enrollments and their first reaction is, well, that's because college isn't worth it anymore. You know, mm -hmm. there's all these, uh, you know, um, uh, PhDs driving taxis and that kind of thing. Right. Um, what we're seeing really is, is more about the economic, the, econ the, sorry, the unemployment rate mm -hmm. and the demographics than about any real perceptible shift in the 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 value or the notion that it's mm. important to go to college and to mm. maximize your education in order to maximize your um, your opportunities in 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 the workforce today um, so our value is still we still value higher ed more or less the same way there's just fewer of us exactly oh, that's a really really important point um, Again, friends, I have a whole stack of questions. Uh, if you'd like to press for clarification, like Jen just did very nicely, or if you'd like to ask for more details, say geographic or racial or having to do with different institutional types, this is a great time to ask. Or if you have any other questions uh, about students uh, in higher education, again, Dr. Shapiro is one of the great, great resources on this. And in the meantime, hello to folks who just come in, like uh, Lena and Luz. Uh, good to see you all here. Um, let me ask uh, another question while people are, are fulminating and, and thinking about it. Um, you know, looking ahead a bit, um, the demog demographer Nathan Graw says that around the year 2024, 2025, we should see the high school graduation population just fall off a cliff. Uh, those are his words. Um, that the reason being that the 2008 financial crash prompted a lot of people to not have babies that year mm -hmm. or following years. Um, so do you, looking ahead, I know forecasting is a very difficult enterprise, but do you see that decline, you know, say 1% every semester continuing and then around 2025, 2026, the decline accelerated? I think that's pretty likely. I mean, in, in, in this respect, uh, you know, the old demography is destiny is pretty powerful. Uh, you can't create new high school graduates out of thin air. Now, the, you know, the high schools have been uh, working harder to make, to try and uh, increase their graduation rates and all sorts of uh, organizations are out there trying to increase the share of high school graduates who go on to college. But I think the bigger effect of that decline in high school graduates will be uh, a a, an extension, a continuation of the trend that we're already starting to see in terms of the behavior of colleges and universities in how they respond to those declines. So one of the first things that we see colleges doing when they're having a harder time finding new students is to turn inward and say, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. what can I, you know, I've got to keep my, my tuition revenues coming in and my seats filled. What can I do to, uh, to increase my chances of holding on to the students I already have, instead of uh, you know uh, trying yeah. to attract more new students, can I can I increase my retention rates and keep more of my current students? And uh, we've seen this uh, already starting to have effects in in our most recent uh, reports that that track student retention and persistence rates and student uh, completion and graduation rates. Mm -hmm. So what we're we're seeing is more students uh, staying in, uh, thanks largely, I think, to the efforts of institutions, particularly in terms of analyzing data and data analytics and, and trying to understand in a, a much deeper way the reasons why students are dropping out or transferring or moving around um, and, and trying to implement interventions and systems and early warning signals, all sorts of things to uh, help students stay in. So we're seeing in our last completions report last, uh, last December, we saw some of the highest uh, 
completion rates. So of all the students who started college six years ago, how many of them have completed a degree mm -hmm. uh, um, anywhere in the US? That's how we define completion as opposed to just graduation rates at the same college where you started. And we've seen some of the highest completion rates since we've been tracking them. Uh, and, and partly that's attributable to these demographic changes, but I think a lot of it has to do with these efforts on the part of institutions. And I think, I think those efforts are, if anything, just getting started. So there's a, there's a shift in a way from the quantity of students towards their increased quality of experience. Yes, quality of experience. I, 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 I was afraid you were going to say quality of students, and that's a much harder no, question. No, to no, no. Famously, famously. Um, in fact, well, on a related note, uh, George Washington University announced that they would deliberately shrink their total student body, but in order to do, but they but by doing so, they would increase their quality, and that's admissions. So think about you know, test scores, SAT, that kind of thing, uh, class rank, but also that they would devote more resources to improving their throughput, uh, to you know, shortening time to degree and increasing their students who graduate, um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, this is a revolution in higher education as we know it. It's a very, very different uh, campus strategy. Absolutely, and, it, and it's also countering another trend that we have been tracking in our data for some time. One of, one of, the, one of the key advantages of uh, the, the data set that the Clearinghouse collects from uh, institutions across the US is that it allows us to see students who are uh, enrolling in more than one institution, whether that's simultaneous, uh, uh, concurrent or simultaneous enrollment, Mm -hmm. um, which might be online, it might be, you know, taking a course at a, two different community colleges in the same same vicinity or all sorts of uh, 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 concurrent enrollment behaviors like that, and also students who are transferring more. So anytime a student changes institution, we are able to track that and identify what had been a, a dramatically growing trend of students who are incorporating more than one institution into their kind of educational pathway. Um, so, so the kind of new normal was not just, you know, the, the old ideal of going to a, a, a leafy green four year campus and staying right. for four years and graduating, but students starting at one school, taking courses at another school, uh, transferring to another school, going to two or three and even more institutions to cobble together a program of study or a degree. Um, so student mobility generally has been a steadily growing trend. More and more students uh, even are taking the traditional route of starting at a community college, completing an associate's degree, and then um, transferring to a bachelor's degree. But the reverse is also true. Students starting at a four-year institution, deciding that's not for them, transferring to community college and completing an, an associate's degree. And uh, that, that trend is now, as I was saying, uh, starting to uh, perhaps max out, perhaps even taper off because of, again, these uh, increased efforts on the part of institutions to hold on to the students they have and uh, uh, try prevent these transfers and or dropouts. Mm. So mm. students are trying to do more to hold on to their students. And we started to see that in our last uh, completions report also, that a higher percentage of students were actually graduating from the same institution when they, where they started from, as opposed to, you know, we had hit, seen for years a pretty consistent across the board about 13% of all students were graduating from a different institution from where they started. And so, that started to taper off. So it sounds like we're seeing increased competition between campuses. I think there's certainly increased competition for first year for starting students, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, there's a, a, a follow another question here from uh, uh, Jen Obando, who is awesome. Uh, and Jen wanted to uh, come back to the demographic question and flesh out one key detail. 
Um, she asks, do, do you think that the decline in the Northeast and Midwest, the decline of 18 year olds, is due to a decline in the birth rate or something else? Um, well, I think it's, it's definitely a, de a, a birth rate demographics trend. So we're seeing that decline coming from every, you know, you can go back to uh, the size of kindergarten classes, first grade, second grade, mm. the, the whole path <laughs> to college, to high school graduation and college, those declines are consistent across the board. And the other part of that is increasing um, uh, um, racial and ethnic diversity of the mm -hmm. class. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, certainly in terms of the, the traditional representation in higher education and um, kind of uh, uh, um, those trends are compounding the effect, I think, of some of these over declines in overall numbers. Do you, it's a good question, Jen. Um, I mean, this is this is a huge social transformation that's that we're living through the, and contributing to um, beyond the education itself. Um, oh, we have a, a question from Ken Soto who uh, um, wants to come back to another point. Uh, we are talking about how college and universities respond to this trend. Uh, one response is to recruit aggressively from other countries. Uh, and uh, Ken Soto asks, can Dr. Shiro can Dr. Shapiro discuss the drop in international students and what factors outside of politics contribute to this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't actually do the best job at tracking international students in our data. Um, not, and the reason for that is that not all colleges uh, submit information on their international students. Mm. Most do, but mm. we don't have a, as complete a picture there as we, as we do for uh, domestic students. But I think from other sources, there's no question that the number of international students studying in the U.S. has declined in the last couple of years. Uh, also, after many, many years of steady increases. Um, and, and that's certainly having an effect on in surprisingly wide kind of range of institutions. Um, I think it used to be, you know, we, we tended to think of only the more um, uh, prestigious or, or prominent institutions that were attracting, able to attract uh, sure. foreign students, particularly for um, graduate programs. But uh, one of the things that we started to see in recent years was, you know, institutions of all kinds all across the country, even, um, you know, Midwestern community colleges that had uh, significant numbers of international students. So those trends are are not isolate, not not limited to just the select few not the institutions. So beyond, it, it's it's another extraordinary development that you know paralleling the overall growth in enrollment until about 2011, we had this growth in international students up until about 2017. But then Ken's question is very, very precise. Ken asks, you know, is there something besides the uh, uh, politics that's responsible? I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't really. I I don't have any inform any kind of data that would support an answer to that question. Unfortunately. Yeah. All I'm hearing just two things. I'm hearing that there's um, depending on the nation and the population, of course, that there is. Uh, nervousness um, or outrage about uh, various U.S. moves against immigration, either the Muslim ban or the situation at the southern border. And secondly, there's fear about school shootings, um, you know, most of which are not happening in higher education, but nevertheless, which are uh, quite photogenic and quite concerning. Mm -hmm. uh, good question, Glenn. So again, friends, if you're new to the forum, um, th these are two different ways you can rapidly uh, pass questions on. Uh, through me to our uh, esteemed guest. So, um, as we as we pull apart these these numbers, as we build a collaborative picture of where students are today, please help us along by by asking your questions or offering comments. Uh, for example, are you seeing this where you are? Uh, if you're say in Michigan or Iowa, are you seeing that decline in the number of high school students? Or if you're in North Dakota or Texas, are you enjoying a boom in the number of teenagers? Um, or do you have any, do you see other implications for 
colleges and universities, as uh, Ken uh, and as Jen mentioned. Um, again, while people are, are thinking hard about this, and this is a, a lot to take in, uh, let me just ask um, a couple more questions to, to follow up and help unfold things a bit. Um, you know, thinking about um, what students study, what is your sense of some of the changes in enrollment that you see through your data, either in terms of majors, what, what people are granted degrees in, uh, or if you can drill down even further to what classes students tend to take? I mean, is a big shift towards STEM continuing to happen, or are there details we should know? Well, I think there's definitely a big shift towards more career-oriented uh, programs. Mm. Um, that's not always STEM, but certainly STEM is an is an attractive part of it. I think there there um, um, there are some there seem to be some kind of natural limits in the in the number of students who are who have the aptitude and the and the interest in real STEM majors. Um, so there was some increase there, but uh, what what I think we've seen more in in terms of increasing percentages of, of uh, majors and degrees is in um, um, things like uh, uh, health services or yeah. uh, you know, business and, and marketing and um, um, uh, majors that students can see a direct path to a career. Right. Um, that right. seems to be what's driving them, and again, it has to do with, you know, that that need to to start earning uh, earning a good wage right away, so you can pay back those loans. I think and start getting ahead. Um, uh, there's a whole raft of questions that just bubbled up, uh, and I need to put these out, which is just tremendous. It's one of the real pleasures and delights I think of the foreign communities. This wide range of ideas. So let me put up a couple of these. Let me ask. By the way, if any of you are in a position where you'd like to speak out loud, appear on the stage, just let me know. Just click that raised hand and uh, you can join us on stage. Uh, so uh, one question, this is from uh, Doyle um, at Kentucky who asks, are the trends that we see nationally in the US similar worldwide? Good question. That's a very good question. And I am I do not have a sense of these, uh, the, how these trends are playing out in other countries, unfortunately. I mean, there's there's the general picture that modernity tends to lead to uh, a dropping in fertility rates. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Bloomberg reported that South Korea's fertility rate was now 0 0.9, and that mm -hmm. the, the average couple had less than one child uh, each. Um, but beyond that, so this is a fantastic question that we should explore. Um, uh, Thank you for raising this, and, and uh, Doug, thank you for, for being so straightforward. Um, we have uh, another question uh, that comes in from Evan Englander, University of Dayton, who asks, back to the increasing completion rates, is there data from the clearinghouse that shows that involvement in clubs and organizations is aiding in degree completion? <laughs> and I should say Evan's the director of fraternity and sorority life, so there's a particular background to his question. Good question. <laughs> That's a great question. You may have more data than I have uh, to support an answer to that question. We uh, we don't know. I mean, we don't uh, we don't track any of that kind of data at the clearinghouse. Um, so we don't we have no way to know which students are more engaged on campus. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, other sources that campuses um, can turn to to help them answer questions like that with on their own. Uh, uh, within their own students, but uh, on a national basis, I don't know of any any results. Well, that's a good question. Uh, and Evan, if you want to follow up with any of your uh, analyses based on your position, in all seriousness, uh, please do. Please do. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and we have um, uh, Jen Obando, who is just a wonderful, wonderful source of energy here. And uh, she has a comment rather than a question, and it's a, she reveals a concern that I share myself, which is that it's uh, scary to think this overall decline in traditional age students might lead to even more aggressive recruiting strategies, like going after students who have already committed to a different institution. Mm. 
Yes, Jen, I can tell you've been watching the news of what's been going on with the, uh, uh, the National Association of, uh, of uh, College Admissions Counseling. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Uh, I think that, I think that uh, those developments raise a lot of concern, and there's no question that colleges are under a lot more pressure to recruit students from anywhere they can find them, and whether those kind of norms of the profession will will be able to survive these changes in uh, in the legal climate around around recruiting and admissions is a is a is an important important question. Well, that's that's definitely a good one. Thank you for thank you for asking this. Yeah. Um, and we have another question, and the question is just pouring in. And friends, you can see how um, <laughs> uh, how easy it is to, to ask these questions. This is really where the heart of the forum is. Uh, this mm -hmm. community discussion. Um, we have one from the excellent Michael Haggins, longtime friend of the program and uh, at Georgia Tech, at Center for 21st mm -hmm. Century Universities. He says that your group's uh, focus on completion and retention is very important. What does your work say about the mode of instruction, such as online or off campus? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really great question. We have, uh, until very recently, not had uh, the ability to track what type of instruct, what mode of instruction students are engaged in. Um, I will, by way of a teaser in our next, uh, about that next report that I mentioned at the very oh. beginning, we'll, uh, that some college no degree report will uh, provide some of our first results that separate out students who completed degrees at online uh, uh, campuses versus uh, kind of bricks and mortar campuses. But again, again, not at the, uh, perhaps not at the level that you're looking at. Um, you know, one thing that we know nowadays is that it's it's not really enough uh, to say, well, is it an online institution or a traditional institution? Because what's what's more interesting is all the online instruction that's taking place and blended instruction that's taking right. place across right. the board. And we still can't in our data set, pick apart uh, course by course what type of, uh, of instruction or what mode is going on. But what we can do and what we have done in this report that's about to come out is um, uh, identify institutions where uh, they're uh, considered predominantly online um, and, and talk about which students are, are uh, um, engaging in those types of institutions, particularly among this some college no degree population. That would be interesting to find out. Um, I mean, that kind of research would be critical. Uh, it's one of the one of the tools in the toolbox that campus has uh, is to be able to change up how it how it uh, conducts yeah. teaching. Yeah. Um, we just please go ahead, please. No, I was just going to comment. I'm I'm impressed with your 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 participants they're asking really hard questions <laughs> about <laughs> it's a great all, community all things that i wish i could answer with our data um but you know basically our data set has traditionally been limited to just basic enrollment facts and completion facts and degree facts um and we're we've got a number of of projects underway to expand that um one of those is an effort to collect more information about course level uh, progression and enrollment in individual courses. Um, mm. We've got a pilot going on with uh, um, um, uh, something over 100 institutions now, I think, that we're expanding um, and really looking forward to the next few years when we will, uh, we would, we hope to be able to say a lot more about um, what's happening in between uh, enrollment and graduation, what types of courses, what types of, of uh, um, major selections and mm. things like that are going on in between. Well, that's going to be essential, essential information. Um, well, Michael wanted to follow up uh, in person. Um, mm -hmm. Michael, you want to turn your mic on. That work? It works perfectly. So good Great. to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Michael. Hi. Uh, your work is really important. I think uh, for folks to understand, and I had asked that question about the balance between uh, online and offline uh, or on campus uh, instruction. 
Um, there is uh, data that's captured uh, you know, in the databases, the NGMS database, uh, concerning a percentage of courses in any particular year by institution that are uh, uh, where okay. credit is being earned online. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you're coordinating all of that data or is your organization separate from that data source yeah completely separate from that okay. data source yeah but to but to follow up on that if we were taking a look at the same time period for comparison purposes then it might be possible to uh, basically walk between those two to the extent that the time periods overlap and the rigor of the data collection uh, from both sources can be said to be uh, approximately equal. Is that a fair? Sure. Yeah, it sounds, yeah, I'm not familiar with that data set, but it sounds like from what you said, that would be a, 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 um, a reasonable approach for a follow up strategy on this work. Um, what we what we used, I will tell you, is the just the ipads institutional characteristics definition of a predominantly online institution which is a pretty high bar it says it's it's it says 90 percent or more of the enrollments at that institution are online right um, yeah the more difficult thing to get at of course is the extent to which folks are learning uh, uh the courses are being taken essentially uh online yeah. uh, predominantly or significant portions of the course are um, right. Online. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks very much uh, to you and for uh, Brian. Thank you. Well, thank yeah, you. Thanks for the question and for the extra information. Oh, Michael is excellent. Um, friends, if you're uh, if you're new to the forum, um, that's how we easy do this: ask a video a question. Just let me click the button, let me know, and pff, I beam you up on stage. The only thing missing is a great Star Trek transporter effect, and I just have to imagine that in my head. <laughs> um, we had uh, a, a couple of questions from uh, Charlene Mew on the, um, on the uh, chat box, and she asked a couple of um, uh, related questions. So let me put them up one at a time. Um, but I, I can't display these, these came in the chat. She asks, first, how do you see colleges and universities trying to retain students? So more lucrative aid packages, more perks, more career services, more robust alumni programs? I think all of the above. I mean, again, we don't yeah. actually see that. We see the effects of that in our data but we don't track what institutions are actually doing in terms of programs and services. I think uh, I, the only thing I would add to that list um, uh, that, that she offered is, is uh, the kind of data analytics that we're seeing, um, or I'm reading about, <laughs> that uh, colleges and universities are increasingly using kind of big data um, assessments of what students are doing on a day-to-day -day basis on campus to try and uh, create uh, early warning systems for students who might be struggling and to um, uh, to um, kind of predict based on uh, patterns from um, existing students uh, what types of supports might help. Well, that's I appreciate again your your straightforward candor about what you can and cannot see in your data. Uh, I, that's, yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons. There are some things that our data are great at, and other things that we just kind of throw up our hands and say, "Wow, I wish I had data to help answer that question." But well, you are expanding in, in what you gather. Uh, Charlene had a, a follow-up question, which is related and ties back to Michael's, which is, "How has the growth of certificate programs played in colleges and universities' growth?" Yeah, well, that's a question I, I do have some things to say about. So excellent question. There's no, um, we, the, we, we've seen a, a steady expansion in certificate programs. And, and what's really interested in, interesting in there is not just that more students are earning certificates at colleges and universities, but that they're, um, they're not just getting them to 
to take straight out into the into the workforce. They're getting them as kind of stacking credentials that lead to uh, um, degrees. So we're seeing more and more associate degree earners, for example, who have earned certificates along the way, uh, one or two certificates and then an associate's degree. More and more bachelor's degree earners who have earned a certificate and then an associate's and then a bachelor's or just certificates and bachelor's. More and more bachelor's degree earners who are going uh, on to earn certificates, post baccalaureate certificates, often at community colleges. Again, mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so these are all things that we can see very clearly in our data, the numbers of students who are stacking credentials. They're looking for shorter term kind of markers or, or um, uh, 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 value um, ads on the way to a degree. And what's interesting there, one part, another aspect of that that's very interesting is that it goes hand in hand with uh, a trend of increasing times to degree. So if you just count how long it takes to get a bachelor's degree today um, or an associate's degree, that's been growing steadily. And part of that is because students are moving around and transferring and stopping out. We know that every additional institution that you enroll in actually lengthens your time to degree. Mm. Um, and so that makes it, you can, you can imagine that that makes it much more valuable and important to have some kind of intermediate credential, right? If it's, take, it's gonna take you six years to earn a bachelor's degree, you've gotta have some way, right, to, to, to uh, kind of establish some progress and maybe uh, have something that can help you in your part-time employment to pay the tuition during those six years, right? But it also can have, uh, uh, a kind of accelerant effect that earning a certificate might actually kind of divert you slightly so that it adds again to the time that it's going to take you to get that um, bachelor's degree. Yeah, it's, a, it's a project management question. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you're, you're expanding your, um, your tool set. You're expanding the multiple areas of, of where you're expending resources and that there's a friction, there's a cost in doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a terrific question, uh, and thank you very much for the great answer. Uh, building on that, we have another great friend of the program, uh, the awesome Roxanne Riskin, who has a, a related question. Oh, I'm not sure if the font came out. Let me just read this to you if it doesn't. Do you see certificate types of credentials increasing in higher ed as a response for filling a gap providing upskilling? And overall, to build on what you just said, is this a positive and favorable trend that will continue? Whew, a lot in that question. <laughs> She's great. Uh, um, wow. I definitely think upskilling is a part of it. There's no question when you when you know all that I've uh, seen in in kind of the, the labor market indicators of what employers are looking for, uh, it's increasingly about skills and uh, and wanting to see specific evidence of the ability to perform specific skills rather than just show me your bachelor's degree right. and I'll assume that means you're competent at whatever I throw at you. Mm. Um, uh, so so, so there's, that's definitely a big part of what's driving this. Whether that's a good thing, ooh, <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Well, that's a good thing for all of us to, to think about. Um, thank you, Roxanne. Uh, we had um, um, uh, a question about uh, one of the uh, clearinghouse's tools. Uh, you have a, a service called Student Tracker, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and that helps college and universities follow student uh, progression. Can you speak a little bit to that, to uh, how that helps us understand uh, students today? Sure. So um, Student Tracker enables any college or university to submit a cohort of students that they're interested in. Um, and uh, the clearinghouse will match that up against our database and provide back uh, essentially directory information that says, here's where those students have been enrolled uh, at any of the institutions that submit their uh, information to the clearinghouse. And what that, what, what that does is, well, when you, if you think of this 
this trend of student transfer and mobility, it's really important for an institution to understand if students are, are transferring out or transferring in from other institutions, where what, what those pathways look like, which students are transferring out, what types of institutions are they going to, what are they majoring in, right. uh, and, and how can that information help me on my campus to either uh, better uh, adapt my own programs to help retain those students and maybe prevent them from transferring if I'm thinking competitively, or, or on the other hand, you, many institutions are taking the position that, look, it's not about, um, you know, tr student transfer and mobility is just a fact of life. It's not necessarily something you can prevent. Students are transferring for all sorts of reasons. It might be economic. It might be about uh, family responsibilities or, uh, you know, a spouse or a parent is moving to a different city for a better job and you've got to move with them. And so the question then becomes, how do I make sure that I'm doing all I can to support those students when that uh, life event happens mm -hmm. and making it easier for them to transfer their credits so it doesn't add a year to their, to their degree time, right? Making it easier for them to, um, yeah. to construct a coherent pathway that's still gonna meet their educational goals. So be, student tracker, again, if you're a strategic enrollment manager or a student advisor, helps you to understand based on the patterns of your existing students when they've transferred, what kinds of supports and what kinds of programs can better meet the needs of today's mobile students. Well, thank you. It sounds like a great effort, uh, great service. Um, and, and people have more questions to follow up that, that go along this line. By the way, friends, we're in about six minutes, we'll approach the end. So we're, we're coming to the to the very close of this session. Um, so make sure you get me your thoughts before it's too late. Um, we have a, a really good question here from uh, Patrick Dixon uh, from Eastern Michigan, I'm sorry, from Michigan State. It says, if enrollment by male students rose to equal out of female, so 50%, wouldn't that help close the forecast decline in the number of students? <laughs> well, I think mathematically, that's an absolute yes. <laughs> Whether that can happen, that's uh, a very good question. I don't. I wish I knew. Uh, that, that is a tricky one, um, but definitely. What's the, what's the breakdown overall for total enrollment? Is about fifty five percent female, forty five percent male. Yes, it's right around there, fifty four, fifty five. And that's for the first time in history. That's a that's a switch. You know, mm -hmm. female. Mm -hmm. um, again, thank you, uh, Patrick, for that question. Um, and speaking of which. Um, we have a, a question from Charles Finley at Northeastern. He says, it appears that students who are being recruited are less prepared uh, to exchange for uh, college level work. Can colleges provide the additional support, which is costly to prepare students? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, and, I, and again, that's one that I just don't have uh, an answer to. I do know though that going back to our, that student tracker service, um, that's another really important value of that, of that service. So for example, we provide student tracker not just for colleges, but also for high schools. And thousands of high schools and districts across the country are able to uh, essentially, through the clearinghouse, see where their graduates are going to college and how they, whether and how they succeed and get real insights into which students uh, appear to have been well prepared for the colleges that they entered mm -hmm. and which ones didn't. And that kind of information, what we see the, 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 um, uh, the data savvy high schools in particular doing is using that to inform their own preparation and programming uh, for high school students. So they, if they can see that, you know, a particular uh, track or, or curriculum or uh, uh, preparation uh, is doing a better job of, of uh, uh, preparing their graduates for um, success, let's say in a local community college or the state flagship, whatever type of institution they're, they're uh, concerned about, 
they can use that information to strengthen their programs and make sure that they're doing all they can to make sure that their students arrive at college ready for college work. So that's uh, another way of collaborating uh, across the secondary, post-secondary barrier. Absolutely. Uh, we have um, a forward-looking question from Liv, or Liv, uh, so let me put this up. This is an interesting one. We're going a little diff different direction. Um, uh, Liv asks, can you please discuss the needs for physical campuses in the future? It seems there is persistent development of student housing, et cetera, in spite of the rise of online programs and decrease in enrollment. Will these trends continue? So, you know, if, if our campuses are more and more online, will our campuses actually look different? Wow, that's a great question, forward-looking. Forward I, I think, I don't think online will ever replace on campus. I think there will always be a need. And I think what, it, what it's going to do is, uh, through these kinds of increasingly detailed data analytics, colleges are gonna, uh, and universities are going to start to learn in much greater detail what parts of the post-secondary experience uh, can be transferred online um, um, effectively and what parts really need uh, on-campus experience. And they'll do better at kind of blending and, and taking advantage uh, yeah. of the, of the um, you know the benefits of each mode of instruction uh, where they're best where they're best used. Well, thank you. Uh, it was kind of blended campus in, in a sense. Um, we have a, a one final question, and it's really appropriate that it comes from Jenna Bondo because Jen opened these questions and she was just on fire. And I want to give her the, the last word. And this is a tricky one. Uh, she asks, is there any difference in your data between ethnic groups and decreased high school graduates, i.e., is there data that students can use to market or incentivize smarter? Well, there's certainly uh, uh, shifting demographics within the high school graduates population um, and shifting demographics within the post-secondary population. And um, so, uh, yeah, there are, uh, um, there, there are very different rates of progression and success and different uh, patterns of enrollment among different, uh, different uh, subpopulations of students, um, particularly um, you know, when we think, for example, about the, the traditional access or institutions like community colleges, um, uh, uh, black and Hispanic students, uh, for example, are far more likely to start their enrollment in post-secondary at a community college. And we, mm -hmm. we've, we've often considered in our data that um, if you were in that, you know, the lower graduation rates at community colleges, um, would have would uh, uh, therefore affect those students the most, but if you allow for the students who uh, don't complete a degree at the community college but transfer before graduation and complete a degree at a four-year institution, that that might be a pathway that could demonstrate um, uh, a kind of closing of some of those gaps of access. Uh, for underserved populations. And um, unfortunately, what we find in our data is that that is not the case. In fact, it's just the opposite, that every kind of step, even of transfer and mobility uh, for students who start at community colleges only seems to serve to widen the gaps mm. in, in attainment and completion. Wow. Oh, that's, that's really daunting. Uh, it comes back to your earlier theme where um, where a lot of the, the the more moving parts we include in the higher education machine, the uh, uh, more challenging and the more complex the uh, process becomes. Yeah. Um, you know, we can only think about this process and its complexity with the help of your kind of research. I, I've got to say, we're at the top of the hour. We have blazed through 60 minutes and... Uh, so I, I can't thank you enough for being so generous with your time and so generous with your answers to all of our questions. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to engage with these uh, amazing participants and all the great questions. I've been, it's been a very stimulating conversation. A lot of fun. Well, we'll have to have you back next year, um, especially when you have another release of, of, of a report or some data. Uh, I, I think this would be a great crew to give you a working over. Looking forward to it. <laughs> now, and then one last question. What's the best way to keep up with the Clearinghouse's work? Oh, well, just, uh, come into our website, nscresearchcenter.org, and we have all of our publications and reports. Um, you can sign up for a blog or our blogs or notifications about when new reports come out, Good. but you can also just browse through our catalog and download any report you want anytime for, for free. You don't, you don't have to uh, do anything for that. That's terrific. Well, um, thank you so much. And uh, we could talk for another hour, I'm sure. But in the meantime, thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Take care, Doug. Bye-bye. Now, the rest of you, don't leave because we have to tell you about what's coming up next week in the forum. So next week, our guest is Dr. Amy Novak, who's the president of Dakota Wesleyan University. And her focus is on innovation, specifically at rural institutions. She has some terrific ideas, some really great plans. Just go to shindig.com slash login slash event slash Novak and sign up for next week. In the meantime, uh, the recording for this session and recent sessions and all of our sessions is available, uh, tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. You can grab our discussion about all kinds of issues, including students and data. And if you wanna keep talking about all these issues and uh, with the role of certificates and transfer all of this, we have many venues for you to do so. We have a Slack group, we have groups on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and we're continuing to talk on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. So in the meantime, please keep the conversations going and thank you once again. Let me just echo our guest's praise. Your questions and comments were terrific. It's a real pleasure to work with you all. Uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, I'll stick around here for a few more minutes if you have questions. Until then, bye-bye. Uh, Lee asked a question, uh, what was the tiny URL for the archive? That's tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Thanks for the question.